When you need an attorney, experience matters. Past success matters. Attention to detail matters. Prince Glover Hayes is celebrating 40 years. 40 years as a civil litigation firm. And delivers over 100 years. Over 100 years of combined experience. We have been able to obtain some of the largest jury verdicts and settlements in the state of Alabama for our clients. We will fight. We will fight. We will fight to make sure our clients get the justice they deserve. Here at Prince Glover Hayes, we counsel. We advocate. We litigate. And we are devoted to helping you. Hello everyone, I'm Mike Royer. Along with Bob Prince, we welcome you to People's Law School. Brought to you by Prince Glover Hayes, law firm here in Tuscaloosa. And on this program, we deal with issues that are important to you and your family. Tonight's topic on the program, how insurance companies settle and defend claims. Our host for the program tonight, attorney Bob Prince. Bob. Thank you, Mike Royer. And welcome to the show. And uh, how many of you have an insurance policy on your car? Well, that's what I thought. Just about everybody does. State law requires it. So well, tonight we're going to talk about insurance, how insurance companies settle claims, when they decide they're not going to settle claims, and why they won't do that. And I, we will focus on an automobile policy because, it, as I said, everybody has one if you have a car, or at least you're supposed to. First of all, Insurance is a contract. Most people don't think of it as a contract. I get a lot of questions like, can I drop my policy? Well, sure you can. They can drop you, you can drop them. The only thing that separates you from dropping is the time period. If you look on your policy, it runs for a year. So uh, it does have an end date and you need to then start looking around for another company, but they can drop you if you have too many claims, and you can drop them if, they, if you don't like how they're treating you. So it's a, it's a contract. It usually has one thing in mind, indemnity. Um, and if you, in the law, we're familiar with that, but maybe you're not. It means to step in the shoes of someone and pay their debt. In other words, to make sure they don't have a loss. So you pay the premium. The insurance company pays you for any losses that you that you might cause. Now, there's a limit. So make sure when, whether it's a homeowner's policy, an automobile policy, or whatever insurance policy you have, it will have not only a time limit, but it'll have a dollar limit. And make sure that you have enough coverage for your car and your home. Okay, so now let's take a look at an automobile policy. You hear all these terms, and I bet you've heard this term. I want full coverage, or I have full coverage. Well, I think that was started by an insurance agent who was selling insurance because what is full coverage? The well, lawyers sort of laugh about it because there's no such thing as like full coverage. That would mean that you would be insured for whatever you did, and that's not what that means. Uh, in fact, I don't think there is a good definition for it because of those limits that I was telling you about. So, the, But it does have components, so let's walk through them. First one. Liability. You have liability coverage. What does that mean? It means that if you cause a wreck, then the insurance company steps in your shoes and pays the person. That's number one. And secondly, they defend you. So they have two du duties there, to indemnify you and, and then to defend you. But again, up to what amount? You have to go to your it's called a declarations page, or at least that's what the lawyers call it. It's usually like page two. It lists every coverage you have and in what amounts. So they will defend you up to that amount. State law says 25000 is the minimum. You really need to have at least 100000 in my judgment, because if you hit somebody and they go to the hospital, if they're broken up at all, then that's going to be the, the, the range of that claim. So liability. Your fault, you injure someone else, pays for their bodily injury, pays for their property damage. <clears throat> Collision insurance, that's the second big category. And it, think of it this way, collide. You collide <laughs> into a tree. 
is not the other person's fault because there is no other person. It's your fault. Uh, then your collision will pay for your car. Now, each one of these coverages has a different premium, and it's on that declarations page I was telling you about. The third one is comprehensive. What does that mean? Well, think of all the ways that your car could be injured or damaged. Hailstorm, uh, tree falls on it, uh, you name it. If, it, it. if it's injured and you make that claim, then they have to pay it if, under your comprehensive. <clears throat> comprehensive has deductibles, so kind of watch that. There's one reoccurring theme in insurance. If you want lower rates, get a higher deductible. And really, insurance should be for a catastrophic loss anyway, if you think about it. You're just protecting yourself from a big loss. Uh, and, and if I have time, we're going to go into some homeowners' policies and some automobile policies and things that you don't want to get, like riders, or make a claim for because they report you. The insurance companies have their own little system, and they will put your name on there, and it's going to be harder for you to get insurance. If you get it, it's going to cost you more. Okay, so comprehensive is the third one. <clears throat> Just about every auto policy has a med pay, a medical payments. It doesn't matter who's at fault, it, you know, five or $10,000, passenger gets hurt, you get hurt, the other person gets hurt, they pay that automatically. Now here comes my favorite, and here's the one you really need to take a close look at. <clears throat> every policy of liability insurance in Alabama, by state law, must have uninsured motorist coverage. They must offer it to you. It's automatic unless you sign it away. You have to, you know, say, I do not want it uh, and sign your name to it. You don't need to do that. <clears throat> Look at it this way. You buy an automobile liability policy, say for $50,000 or $100,000. Well, you're protecting the other person in case you run a red light. With uninsured motorists, you are protecting yourself your family members, because what it means is this. <clears throat> the other driver runs a red light. It has to be their fault, and, but they only have $25,000 worth of insurance, or maybe they don't even have any. They just got in the car, and, and uh, they didn't renew their policy. Well, you can look to your policy under the uninsured motorist coverage. It ha as I said, it has to be the other person's fault, but if your coverage is only $25,000, that's all you're going to get. So I say, pull that insurance policy out. Look at it. This is the cheapest coverage insurance companies offer, uninsured motorists. It's like a third or a fourth of what liability is. Get those rates up there, not rates, but the, the, the coverage, because you need protected. There are, a lot of, there are most drivers on the road, $25,000 in insurance liability. It's not enough. They actually do it in two numbers, $25,000 per person, $50,000 in total. So if four people were in your car and they all got hurt, $50,000 is all they ever have to pay. They pay $25,000 to any one, but no more, and then there's that total uh, behind it. So this is very important coverage. <clears throat> now, you can see on the PowerPoint, we talk about underinsured. It's the same principle. It's covered under the uninsured. What that means is they have insurance. They're not uninsured. They're under. They only have $25,000. You hurt, break both arms and your claim's worth $100,000. If, unless you go against your own company, you're, you're out of luck. You're going to be stuck with $25,000. One other interesting thing about uninsured motorists, the law allows you to stack those coverages. If you have three cars, you're paying three premiums then you can stack like pancakes. Um, if your claim's worth 100000 you can stack up to that amount. So this is very important. If you don't hear anything else I say tonight, <clears throat> go look at your policy. Make sure that you have sufficient uninsured motorist coverage. If you think you don't, call your agent. He'll be happy to sell it to you. Mike, I think we have a question. We do, and this one's from Jake up in Walker County, and I feel kind of bad for Jake, Bob. You'll see why. I backed <clears throat> into one of my own vehicles. I had full coverage on one vehicle, but the one hit only had liability, and now the insurance company says it won't cover it because both vehicles were mine. Is this common practice for an insurance company? 
Well, actually it is. They, there is a rule that insurance companies, if you look at the policy, they exempt claims between family members. And the reason is because they're too easy to fake. You know, yeah. They're too easy to manufacture. But uh, I think he needs to go see a lawyer because it sounds to me like he, where there's no personal injury, he's got collision insurance, they're going to have to pay that. All right, let's talk about how insurance companies make money. Well, this is pretty interesting, too. <clears throat> the, the anatomy of an insurance company on how they do. Well, we all know you have to pay premiums. But did you know that they take those premiums and pool them and invest them in bonds and stocks? And, hey, if the economy goes down, you can bet your premiums are going to go up. I don't care if it's health or automobile or whatever it is. They, insurance companies make money investing, and they have to answer to stockholders, and they're not going to lose money. So what that means is if it's good times like we're having now, you can shop around and get a good rate. You can get coverage. But if the economy turns down at all, the insurance companies immediately start pulling in those premiums. You know, they look at it and say, oh, and they raise them on us. So <clears throat> They pay claims, no doubt about it. They, they get money in from premiums, from investment, and they pay claims. And that paying claims is pretty, pretty important. <clears throat> Several years ago, the lawyers noticed that there was a certain insurance company that it seemed like they would deny all claims. It didn't matter. If, if the other driver ran a red light and hit you and you made a claim on his insurance or her insurance, that company would just say, we're not paying you. <laughs> we don't care. We're, just, we're not paying you. They would just deny the claim. And then if you got a lawyer, and, and by the way, a lot of people would just quit right there. They just wouldn't make a claim, wouldn't get a lawyer. So the company would save money. Then if you did get a lawyer, then they, what would happen then is they would file suit and the company would delay. We got the paperwork from the insurance company. It was called the 3D defense. Deny the claim, delay the claim, defend the claim. So they would delay it for months and months. They would think of all these reasons why they didn't, weren't ready to give you the amount of money you, that they owed you. Well, in the meantime, you may be out of work. You may need the money, so you take their offer. It's a low-ball offer. They saved a lot of money doing that. Thirdly, if, if, they, if you held out and got past the delay, they would go to court and defend it. Now, this didn't last long because the lawyers were popping them in court and the verdicts changed their minds. So, but, but you're getting a good lesson now. I mean, we actually got the documents from the, and it was more than one company too. And this was a, uh, a, a scheme. It was a plan. It was how they were going to make more money on the backs of people making claims. And by the way, on their own policyholders too. But mainly people making claims. <clears throat> All right, Here, here's another one that I want to talk about. This slide you're going to see is, says not covered, <laughs> not allowed, no way, no how. What that means is it's what I just told you, delay, delay, delay. <clears throat> There's a difference in who sells you that policy and who adjusts that policy if you have a claim. There are two different things. You know, you, you might meet the nicest salesperson in the whole world, goes to church with you, he's your neighbor, or she's in your social club, and they're sweet and nice. And you buy the insurance, homeowners, auto. Then you make a claim. Well, that sweet, nice neighbor, social member, you don't see them. They're gone. They're back there selling somebody else. You get the claims department now. You get the adjuster. He doesn't go to church with you. He doesn't know you. That adjuster has one goal, hold the claim down. The less that claim is, the more money insurance companies make. All right, so adjusters, that's their job, no, no doubt about it. Uh, and it's amazing to me that when we represent people, they'll say, well, can, can't I call so-and-so and, and make him pay this claim? And I go, hmm, I wish we could. You're welcome to call him. But he's just going to say, Ms. Jones, I'm sorry, that's in the claims department. <laughs> We're in the sales department over here. So adjusters, just keep in mind that you're, if once you file that claim, I don't care if it's on your own policy or not, you're not going to get that person uh, who sold it to you. Now, I have had cases 
where the salesperson came and went to bat for the person. Sometimes that works, and usually it does not. Okay, <clears throat> let's see what, what happens when a claim is filed. All right, this one, what you're going to see is a lot of arrows and a lot of things, but, but basically it works like this. A case is, a claim is made, adjuster gets it. That adjuster has to find out the facts of the case. He's looking at liability. He or she has to determine fault. And if they, if they get the police report and it says their policyholder ran a red light, then they switch to you and they say, all right, we need to know your damages. What were your injuries? Did you lose any work? How, what, what about your car? Is it damaged? Now, you're dealing with an adjuster here. So bear in mind, it's like sometimes no rules. They will tape you. They will call you and tape you. They will not tell you that. Uh, and if you say the wrong thing and then later end up in a lawyer's office, they try to use that against us. They'll say, well, well they told us it wasn't hurt that bad. Um, so, you know, it's, you have to be careful about dealing with an adjuster. They also get witness statements and they do background checks on you. Of course, lawyers do the same thing. We're busy doing the exact same thing that they are. We, the first thing we do is we haul off and order all your medical records. Uh, all, all lawyers do that. I don't just mean we do. Uh, we go and investigate. We talk to the trooper. We look at witnesses statements. We take witnesses statements. We tape them or get them to sign it. Uh, we find out are there any other witnesses. We talk to neighbors sometimes about your injuries. Is John the same as he was before? I know he broke his arm, but did you ever see him out gardening or anything? Yeah, he worked in the yard, but now he can't do it. Well, that's a damage that you, would, you might never think to tell the adjuster. If you're trying to handle your case by yourself, your claim, they're not going to volunteer to you all the things that you're entitled to. So both sides are trying to figure out who's at fault and how bad the injuries are. And I'm, I'm saying it's an ordinary car wreck case. Mike, we have another question. We do. This comes from Birmingham, and Mike asked this question. When I have an accident and need to make a claim, do I call the number on my insurance card that I carry in my car, or do I call the person who sold me my policy? Mike, he needs to call the number on that card. Uh, the person that sold him the policy is in the sales department. He's now dealing with the claims department, and there are two different uh, divisions of the insurance company. So call that 1-800 number. Hope you're never involved in a wreck. Hope you're never injured in one. But if you're able to, if you're not injured to the point where you can't do it, t pull out your cell phone and take pictures of the damage to the cars, the location, because it's amazing how uh, all of a sudden somebody might not, they'll say they're not injured at the scene, and then two or three days later they say they are injured. Now that can happen. That's a, that's a medically known fact. But unfortunately, sometimes that does not happen that way. And the person you hit will say, oh, well, I hurt my back now. I can't go to work. Well, if, you show, if you've taken a photograph and it shows no damage to the bumper, they, they're going, your insurance company is probably not paying that claim. Okay, let's go now to <clears throat> something that uh, I've found interesting over the years I practiced. When I first started practicing, if you had a wreck, the adjuster would be on equal footing with the lawyer. I mean, we both would look at the claim, the liability aspect of it, the damages, the injuries, but that's no longer true. The insurance companies now work with software programs. The favorite one they use is called Colossus. And what happens is this, the, the company will input the information. They have some control over what Colossus says. They'll put in like your age, where are you from, what kind of car you have, what your job is, what your gender is, it spits out a range of settlement. Okay, so the, the adjuster looks at it and says, okay, I know from this that I shouldn't pay over $50,000. Let's say it spits out uh, on the sheet there for him, forty to 60000 Okay, he calls the lawyer up or calls you up and says, I've looked at this and I'll make you an offer of twenty-five. Now, remember that Colossus told him it was 40 to 60. And, of course, that thing's always low anyway. He starts lowballing. If you don't have a lawyer, we, we know from past experience they will say things to you like, 
hey, you know, if this wreck was at all your fault, you can't win. That's the law in Alabama. And they sort of browbeat you into a settlement. So, you know, they not only record you, but they'll also not be truthful with you. And so if you've got any kind of claim, you need to get to a lawyer. It doesn't have to be our firm. Just get to a, a lawyer that handles personal injury. You'll see on this um, cost of defense slide, it will show the demand the lawyer makes on somebody. Um, and then it will say um, a certain amount plus or minus for the lawyer. Now, now think about that for a second. All you people that <clears throat> love to go get these lawyers who stand on the 18-wheelers and they all got these cute ads. Well, let me tell you something that the insurance companies do. They keep track of every lawyer performance in court. Will he go to court? Or does he spend his time making cute TV ads? Because if he doesn't go to court, they are not going to offer him the full value of that claim. Now, I'm not just saying this. The insurance companies say this. They have a book on the lawyers. They keep a book on us. And they say, will this lawyer sue us? And if he sues us, will he go to court? Or maybe it's a female lawyer that's got a good reputation for suing. They get more. And <clears throat> on the flip side of that coin, uh, if that guy standing on the 18-wheeler all the time, he doesn't have time to go to court with everybody that calls him. And they know that. And so what happens is they'll say, they just draw a line in the sand. They say, no, we won't pay you over 50000 Well, if he won't go to court, guess what? He comes to you and says, well, they've offered fifty. I think it's a good deal. We need to take it. So <clears throat> you wouldn't hire a doctor. You wouldn't hire a doctor. You wouldn't go to a doctor if you had a serious medical condition because he had some kind of cute ad or she looked cute on TV. No, you would search around, do an investigation. You get the best doctor you could get. You need to do that with lawyers too. I wouldn't hire a lawyer just because I thought he had a good ad or somebody was holding up some check with a bunch of zeros. Um, that's not any way to get a good settlement. And then, like I said, they gonna go to court with you if, uh, if, the, if they turn that settlement down? Mike, I think we have a question. We do, and Bob, I've heard you talk about this before. James from Tuscaloosa says, I see a lot of advertising for insurance companies on television. How do I really go about making a wise decision on selecting a company? What kind of questions should I ask? Well, the first place I would go, Mike, is I would go to the Internet because there are a lot of studies, like I quoted tonight, on what are the best companies, which are the ones are the worst. I'd also ask my friends, hmm. you know, what kind of policy do you have? Is that company, are they treating you right? So there's two sources right there, but I think the Internet is the best place to go. Okay, <clears throat> you've got an automobile insurance policy. Well, let's, see, let's see how yours ranks. Let's see if it's any good. <clears throat> so what happened was a study was done about like 24,000 policyholders, automobile. And they said based, <clears throat> based on you know, how, how quickly they made the claim, how they treated you in the claim, all these criteria. And here were the best ones that they came up with. USAA was third. Now, there's a policy that a lot of folks have, but that's military, right? Uh, you can't, everybody can't get that one. Seven was the Cincinnati. That's a good company. Uh, I know from personal experience on that one. Auto owners and travelers. Well, let's see who's, who the worst ones are. MetLife was number two. Just There you go. And you see them mayhem down there. <laughs> These are cute commercials, and you go buy them, buy this insurance. Then when you have a claim, oh, it's mayhem, all right. It's on, the mayhem's on you. MetLife was the second one. Progressive was four. And, you know, Liberty Mutual have all those cute ads standing there by the bay with the, with the Statue of Liberty behind them. But look where they are. They rank fifth worst of all insurance companies. Okay, I could go on and on, but one thing that you just need to remember is this. Go look at your insurance policy, whether it's homeowners or whether it's auto. Check your coverages. If you have any questions, either call your agent at the insurance company or call a lawyer and find out. Thank you for having me, and I've enjoyed talking to you tonight. Bob, a lot of great information tonight. It affects everyone because every single person comes in contact with insurance companies and might need a good attorney's help from time to That's time. Right. Thank you. And we thank, thank you for you. watching our program. Hope you've enjoyed this edition of People's Law School and hope you'll join us again 
next time. When you need an attorney, experience matters. Past success matters. Attention to detail matters. Prince Glover Hayes is celebrating 40 years. 40 years as a civil litigation firm. And delivers over 100 years. Over 100 years of combined experience. We've been able to obtain some of the largest jury verdicts and settlements in the state of Alabama for our clients. We will fight. We will fight. We will fight to make sure our clients get the justice they deserve. Here at Prince Glover Hayes, we counsel. We advocate. We litigate. And we are devoted to helping you. Uh, you know, there are a lot of lawyers, but the things that separate the really good lawyers from just an average lawyer, one, you have to care about your client. You have to want to help that client. That's, I think, the highest priority for a good lawyer. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, y'all can slice and dice this all you want to. There are a lot of lawyers, but a lot of them just look at it as a business, and it's not just a business. I mean, you're, the business is helping people. And so I think that's the number one criteria. Number two, you have to know the law. Um, you know, a lot of lawyers know the law, but you have to know it in that particular person's area of the law, whatever their problem is. Third, you have to be a great communicator, not a good one. You have to be a great communicator because you have to communicate with clients so that they understand you and the process. You have to communicate with a jury. You have to communicate with a judge. And if you fail on any of those, then you can't be an effective lawyer. And fourth, you must have a reputation as being somebody that's honest, that if they say something, they mean it, uh, and you can, uh, you, know, you can trust what they say to you. In my judgment, what makes a good lawyer is a person that just will not quit. Um, often when you get in a case, you're going to hear from the other side, this is not a good case. You can't win this case you'll never prevail in this case. You're throwing good money after bad. And it's just a constant breakdown of their defense. And so through hard work, through persistence, through dedication and belief in your own client, you will eventually get there. And for me, I think just the willingness to say, I'm not gonna quit, I'm going to reach that success for my client is what makes a good attorney. Uh, tenacity, hard work, integrity, honesty, transparency with your clients and with the other side, those are some of the main things. Experience. Um, you know, my, my husband has practiced law for ov over 40 years and I couldn't tell you how many lawsuits he's tried. Matt and Josh both have a lot of courtroom experience. So that's really important. It's not only important, but because it'll help you perform in the courtroom. I think it's important because other lawyers who are defending our lawsuit um, know that these lawyers will go into the courtroom. Some lawyers just don't want to try cases and they, they may be more apt to settle. Um, the lawyers in this firm are ready, willing, and able to go to court. Well, you know, there are a lot of law firms out there too. There are a lot of law firms that do personal injury. I think the thing that separates our firm is number one, we all care about the clients. Right? I know that sounds uh, cliche, but that's the highest priority here. It's in our mission statement. I preach that, the other lawyers practice that. So I think that's the number one thing that separates us. But we also, besides just counseling somebody, we're prepared to go to trial. You know, and you don't always see that in lawyers. A lot of lawyers are afraid of the courtroom, but at the people in this law firm, not only do I teach trial, but the, st the lawyers here have gone through the trial program and we have, a, we have a history of trying cases. People's Law School is brought to you by Prince Glover Hayes as a community outreach class offered by the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute.